So Kamal, um, Alin and I, we are both working for Invigo. Um, Invigo is a, a Belgian-based law firm specialized in, um, in R&D projects in, in technology sectors and, um, and pharma. Um, in, in IPAD, we are external counsel to Janssen Pharmaceutica. And uh, Janssen is, as you will probably know, um, the coordinator of this project. So that is why we got involved and also why um, we were asked to give um, or to entertain you for around 50 minutes um, on more legal aspects um, relating to data sharing and, um, and GDPR. Um, maybe just a quick word on, on Alin and, um, and then we can uh, do um, also a small tour de table is it, if that is still possible to know who you are and, and what you do uh, in EPET. Um, so Alin Smith um, started working at Invigo, I think, right at the beginning, um, almost. Um, she joined immediately. She worked before for an, uh, an English law firm, um, Ellen and Overy, and um, she is specialized in, in pharma R&D, but also in something totally different, um, labor law. Thank you. And on the other hand, we have uh, Wouter de Meijer, who is uh, the founder of Invigo, um, also a life sciences uh, lawyer and has gained experience over the years in other law firms as well in pharma and R&D. Um, Wouter has also uh, broad experience in IMI project and he was heavily involved in the EPAD project as of the start. <clears throat> so the the purpose of this, this uh, presentation, it remains a legal presentation, but before everybody has a tendency to hang up now, um, we have tried to make it as understandable as possible for people without a legal background. Um, and we have tried to focus on, on topics that we believe are useful in a, in a day to day practice within the EPAT uh, project. So our presentation um, handles on two main topics. The first topic um, will be elaborated further by Walter um, regarding the contractual aspects for accessing EPET uh, data. We will give a practical or more practical overview on the do's and don'ts uh, when accessing EPET data and um, the steps to follow to request EPET, uh, access to EPET data. And then the second main topic, we will further elaborate on the impact of GDPR to EPET dating sh data sharing and access, um, which I will elaborate it, um, further on. Um, we will start with a short intro on GDPR and its scope and its uh, envisaged purposes, and then the potential impact of GDPR on day-to-day practice within the EPAD project and the points of attention to take in consideration when dealing um, with EPAD data. So I will give the word now to Wouter on the first topic. Right, uh, the contractual aspects. Um, as Alin said, we, are, uh, we have simplified them for the purposes of, of this call. Um, so that also means that from a legal perspective, sometimes we have generalized things, um, which also means that if you really have a specific issue within your organization, please always reach out to your legal counsel because the EPET project agreement uh, is obviously much more detailed and nuanced than um, we will present here today um, on the slides. So. We have three main IP concepts um, in the EPET project agreement, and they all have their own meaning. We have background, um, foreground, and sideground. Uh, to start with the first one, what is background? Um, and, and when you see this, you really don't only have to think about intellectual property rights, like, like patent rights, which are used in, in a project, uh, or, or trademarks or so, but uh, under IMI rules, this can be really anything, um, anything which has more or less of a proprietary nature. Um, so also just a general data set, which is contributed to a project can consist of, of backgrounds. 
So not only intellectual property rights, also data can be background. What are the conditions for something to be background? Well, it needs to be uh, owned by uh, an EPET party or, or in licensed from another party can also be the case. Uh, it needs to be in existence before the project needs to be necessary to carry out an EPIT task. And also, and that's an important one, it needs to be listed as background uh, in the project agreement. So that's the first concept of background, pre-existing proprietary data or IP. Um, we listed the separate categories here, which we have in EPET. You have many different types. Why do we distinguish them? Because some need to be protected a bit more given their nature than other ones. Um, for instance, you have background around products which will be tested in the project, you have, which is a IMP background. You also have background around software, which is brought into the project. That's for instance, technical solutions background. But I don't think we have to go through them in, in detail. Um, the concept of, of foreground, well, um, foreground is, um, is really um, everything that comes out of the EPET project um, and, and with everything, well, we really mean a lot. We mean data, intellectual property, intellectual property rights, we mean materials. Um, but there is one condition, it needs to be done during EPET. Um, meaning also as performance of a task within EPET, but also within the original objectives of EPET. Um, and that's exactly the difference with the category of, of side grant. Um, side grant is the same, but it is generated um, during the EPET project, but outside of its objectives. For instance, a typical example which is given, it may scientifically not make a lot of sense, but we, we're doing an Alzheimer project here. If by any chance we would find that a certain product tested in the project is also active um, in another indication, well, that knowledge would be side ground and not foreground because it's not within the original project objectives of, um, of EPET. So what categories of foreground do we have? And again, we have distinguished them because later on um, we need to assess um, or we have different data access rules applicable to them. Um, we have, first of all, the LCS data, uh, which is qualified legally in the project agreement as EPET cohort foreground. Um, we also have a register foreground, which is, for instance, the, the fingerprinting information generated by work package uh, three uh, in the project. Um, we have IMP foreground. So far, as you know, under EPET, we do not yet have a, an interventional study. But when this would kick off, still during the term of EPET, any data around uh, that intervention um, which is generated under the POC protocols uh, would be considered as IMP foreground. And again, that has a whole set of different rules um, on accessing it. Side ground we um, discussed. Um, to illustrate this and um, you might know this picture. It, it comes from the description of the action. It's especially the part uh, on the bottom end of the slide, which illustrates the, the data flows. The one on top is the more, more of the subject flows. But this picture illustrates quite nicely how data flow um, work in EPET and what would be considered foreground, what would be considered background. Uh, for instance, here on the, the left bottom part, we have the parent cohorts, the parent cohort data. Well, typically this is something not generated under the EPET project, but pre-existing. 
So that would be considered background, which is needed to carry out um, EPAD work. So these parent cohorts would be uh, fingerprinted in, in work package three. Um, and with that information, the EPAD registry is built. The EPAD registry on the other hand would be foreground because it, it results from a, an activity within the project. Um, that register then flows into the LCS, a certain subjects in the registry are selected to uh, be enrolled in the LCS. Additional data is generated on those subjects. Well, that additional data also generated as an EPED task. So that means that we have foreground. And in this case, it will be EPED cohort foreground around the LCS. Um, that cohort foreground uh, will be hosted in a database. It's possible that the database, and it's likely, I believe, the database is specifically created for, um, for EPED. Well, that's probably software results, um, meaning it would fall under the category of, um, of technical solutions um, foreground. Um, and then as a last item, we have the trial data. Uh, in this case, that would be IMP foreground. So just to illustrate, um, the distinctions between, uh, in this case, background and the different types of foreground, which we will have in, in EPAD and which each have their um, specifics on how we can access them. Now, it's important to qualify in which bucket, which type of background or foreground certain data would belong in order to know who actually owns it because who owns it will also have the right to publish it for instance but also the right to control access which needs to be granted to other parties so for background that's very easy uh, each party owns the background it contributes to the project for the foreground uh, certainly in epad um, it's quite complicated. I think what, what you have to remember, um, and, and that's the most important distinction, is that in EPAD, any data which relates to the longitudinal cohort study is owned by the managing entity of EPAD, and that's Edinburgh. And at the time that was um, decided um, from a legal perspective, also from, from a business perspective, there were reasons, but for, from a legal perspective, this has great benefit because it simplifies so much on how we can um, access that data um, later on. Uh, the other bigger type, which uh, you might want to remember is IMP foreground category, that's the POC data. Um, that is owned by the IMP contributing participants. So the, the party who controls the intervention, which is tested in the trial, um, will also own any POC data uh, flowing from it. You have other categories, but yeah, uh, I think you will be provided with the slides later on so you can uh, consult it later. Side ground, um, don't think we have to stop a long time with that. You have two categories and IMP side ground is assigned to the IMP contributing uh, participant. This was the example we gave around um, generating an output uh, on another indication, for instance, than initially expected. Now we discussed the different categories of background foreground and side ground and what they actually uh, mean, these concepts. We discussed the ownership of them. Now we come to the access. Um, how can a party access um, background data, foreground data? And here you have different types of, um, of access rights under the project. Um, we will only discuss the first two but there are there are five and, and three, four and five are also detailed in the project agreement, but likely not really relevant for this presentation. So let's focus on the, the first two ones as, as these might be more relevant for you uh, in your activities um, in EPAD. Uh, 
the first one is an access right for completing uh, the EPET project. Uh, the second one is an access right um, for any other type of research you do, um, not directly under the EPET project. Um, there are two types of conditions um, which apply to accessing data to bigger categories. So either you can do it without any condition and, and that we call royalty free. Um, that means it's automatically granted already in the project agreement. You don't need to file a formal request. There are no negotiations with the owner of such data and it's entirely cost free. So it's not restricted to the absence of a royalty. It's really entirely cost free. The other type, which you may have already seen, is fair and reasonable conditions. And that means anything else than royalty free. Um, and it, it can really be a broad range of conditions. We can have uh, financial terms, you can have time delays for access. Uh, sometimes you need to grant a license back on the results you obtain with your research. You can agree on joint publications, for instance. Um, and there are two types of fair and reasonable conditions. Either uh, sometimes we have pre-agreed on them in the project agreement, or sometimes they need to be negotiated with the owner um, of the foreground or background um, concerns. Um, what is completing the EPET project? That's the first type of access right. Well, it's really any task which you can find back in the description of work. And, uh, and also that's also important. Your organization needs to have a role in that task, meaning needs to have an, a reported activity in that task um, as described in the description of work. If, if that is the case, uh, you can exercise your right to have access rights to a, a certain data point for completing the project. Um, when you can show that indeed it's really an EPET task you're carrying out, well, then it's really easy. You can just um, take the data and do your EPET um, task with it. There are no formal um, access rights rules or, or requests to be uh, made. Uh, you only need to respect uh, confidentiality. For instance, you cannot uh, uh, publish it or you, you cannot forward it outside of your organization. That, that's quite obvious, but you can quite easily use data owned by another party um, for doing that EPET task that you were assigned to. Um, what if you want to use data for any other purpose um, than an EPET task? Then we come into the realm of what is called research use. Um, and in IMI projects, this is really a broad definition. Um, basically, it's everything else than performing an EPET task or direct commercialization of results or background. Um, so if you perform a direct marketing activity, I, I understand none of you will intend to do that. But then, of course, you need to agree with the owner on, on certain um, commercial terms. Um, next slide illustrates how the different access rights um, are structured in the, um, in the EPET project agreement. Um, first for foreground, then for, uh, for background. And, and then we will go into the more um, practical aspect of this call to translate this all um, a bit in, in what this can mean for you um, in day-to-day -day practice. So um, types of foreground, again, I, I don't think we need to go through the full slide, um, maybe just um, highlighting the first three of them. So LCS data, which falls into the EPET cohort foreground bucket, um, they're generally um, parties have just a free right to perform also research on it outside of EPET. Um, without informing even the other owner without having to pay anything for it, for instance. 
registered foreground, although scientifically that may be a bit less relevant, um, but um, more or less the same concept, you can access it quite easily and for free. The POC data is something else because that's more commercially sensitive to the contributor of the intervention. So um, if you have access to certain POC data and want to use that for an, another type of research project, please be reminded that this is quite restricted um, in the project agreement. So always get in touch with your legal counsel um, as um, um, the process uh, in the project agreement for accessing such data would need to be complied with. Um, background, access for research use. Um, here important to mention is that uh, parties cannot just get an access to background from other participants on a standalone basis. Um, and what does that mean? That under IMI rules, you really have to show that you need the background in order to um, make use or be able to make use of results. And a, a typical example, which is always given, is for instance, a, a software which is developed under the project. If that is um, partially based on a source code which already existed, well, then you can show that in order to use the end result of the software, you would also implicitly need access to the background source code, um, which is why we have these, what we call de-blocking uh, access rights to background in order to really make use of the output of the foreground of this project. Again, uh, different types of access rights based on what buckets um, we end up with. Um, before we go into some questions for the group, um, can we get more information from you on what you actually do within EPET and, and how you use um, EPET data um, either for EPET purposes or whether you would also like to use that um, for purposes, research purposes um, outside of EPET. A few questions to, um, um, to finish off this topic. Um, and, and also to illustrate what we just presented on access rights to foreground and background. So imagine that you would need access to the LCS data in order to carry out a task um, a task under the a POC trial, which is running during the EPET project. Um, what is then the right answer uh, projected on the slide? Um, is it A, can you use the data without any specific procedure and without informing the owner? Um, B, can you do that but with informing the owner? Or C, do you need to ask approval from the owner of the LCS data? Um, a is, um, is, is correct. Um, so uh, you can use the data um, without going through any specific procedure. So th thanks for that answer. Um, second question. Um, so you want to use parent cohort data, which was generated in 2012. So before the project starts um, by an EPET partner um, to carry out a task in the LCS. Uh, again, can you use that data without any specific procedure, without informing to the extent that such data was listed as background? Um, B is same answer, but now with informing the owner. And C is no, you need to ask approval from the owner of the parent cohort data. Data generated in 2012, that means it's background. It's not yeah. foreground under EPET. Um, background of an EPET partner. Uh, then you need to see, um, has it been listed as background? And if it is listed, uh, the answer is actually that you can do it, access it without any further conditions. Okay. Um, building upon that same question, 
but now it is a non epad partner who contributes the backgrounds. Um, and then the situation becomes more complex because the non epad partner has not signed up to what we agreed in the project agreement. It's not a party. So actually there are no access rights um, applicable towards the data of that partner. And then the answer is we need to take a look how that non epad partner, for instance, a TTC site was contracted in order to know more about whether the data of that non epad partner can be accessed. And we advise you then to reach out to your legal contact to, uh, to find out. Um, I think I would like to use EPET modeling data to perform a research which may benefit the goals of EPET, EPET but is not described in the description of work. What is then the answer? Can you use that data? Um, for, for such research without needing to go through any specific procedure without informing the owner. Again, with, informer, with informing the owner, or you need to ask approval from the owner of the LCS data. It's A, so um, risk modeling data is a category which is um, quite easily accessible under the project agreement. And that's, of course, different for POC data. The last question here. Um, POC data used to perform research outside of EPET. Um, how can you proceed with that? Um, again, you can use it without needing to go through any specific procedure. B, you need to inform the owner. C, you need to comply with pre agreed terms for IMP foreground as set out in the PA. C. Yes, that's correct. Um, something else, and, and this is more a condition to get access more than the legal aspects. Um, you might have heard it at the General Assembly in Amsterdam, but EPET is currently also installing a research access process. Um, this is actually uh, a simplified way of accessing data through an IT platform, which EPET is developing. And certain conditions apply to that process. So you need to file a request in most cases. Uh, you might be required to share back your research results. There are certain standards for publications. But in, in the end, it's a useful tool because it might help you in your research. Just so you know, and to compare it with what we have under the project agreement, for EPET partners, this process is optional, meaning that you can choose to um, access data through that process. And in that case, you have to comply with its rules, or uh, you can also still request data access and, and in, in that way data transfer um, through the general terms of the EPET project agreement. So take that into account if you would, if certain conditions of this process um, are not in accordance with your research goal, for instance, disclosing the results that can be possible in certain scenarios, that EPET partners have the right to request direct access um, under this process. One last note uh, before Aline will take over for GDPR. Um, just so you know, when you make a publication um, which includes EPAD data, whether it's foreground, background, even if your organization owns the, uh, the data, be reminded that um, in some cases, when foreground is included uh, in the publication, that you need to circulate it to all parties for um, for review in accordance with the project agreement. That is sometimes forgotten. So this, this is a bit a side of access, but we wanted to uh, inform you of that. That brings us to the second part of the presentation, GDPR. Alin? Yes, thank you. Um, so on the presentation for the GDPR, 
I am sure uh, many of you might, might have received uh, countless emails uh, in the month of May, May um, on changed terms and conditions of um, entities. Um, so I will give first a short intro introduction on the GDPR, but given the time, I will not. Um, this will not take very long. So the GDPR is just uh, a European regulation that aims to harmonize existing laws on data protection and actually to increase uh, the protection of, of data subjects. It came into force uh, last May 2018 and it applies to entities within the European Union which process personal data uh, regardless of whether or not processing takes place in the Union um, and it also applies to non-European entities when processing data of data subjects in the European Union, when offering goods and services within the European Union or monitoring, monitoring behavior of um, EU data subjects. So even after Brexit, um, entities located in the UK may still have to face the consequences of GDPR as they process um, data of data within the European Union. So the GDPR has had quite um, a big impact as it has been the biggest shakeup um, in over 20 years in data protection law. It has inserted more stringent obligations, for example, um, losses of, of data or data breaches have to be um, reported. Um, in some cases, entities need to engage a data protection officer. There are various obligations with regard to proportionality of gathering the data, a legal basis, fairness, etc. The entities need to show their compliance with the GDPR and non-compliance is um, punished more severely with severe fines up to 20 million euro or 4% in annual turnover. Um, it's uh, envisaged so to increase the protection of the data subjects. For example, if the data is um, processed on the basis of the consent of the data subjects, strict conditions apply. And also there has, there's an increased transparency towards data subjects. They have to be informed that they can access their data. They have a right to be forgotten. They can correct their data, data etc. Then um, I, would try to uh, I would like to focus on some key definitions in the GDPR, which, which are useful and which is the core of the GDPR. Of course, first of all, you have um, personal data. And personal data is any information uh, relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And an identifiable natural person is somebody that can be identified whether indirectly or directly um, with reference to identifiers such as a name, uh, an ID number, a location, but also uh, factors that are more specific to somebody's physical, genetic, uh, cultural, economical, social identity. So that's actually a very broad scope and you have a lot of data that are considered to be personal data under the GDPR and for which, for which does the GDPR applies. Um, however, you should take into account that whether data are not considered as personal data also relates to the context in which data are collected. If you, for instance, ask for a data uh, subjects organization that it works for, as such that will not be considered as personal data, as there might be a lot of persons working for that organization. The same if you ask for somebody's occupation uh, as standalone data that does not indicate um, a person's uh, identity. But if you combine those two, so the organization and the occupation, it may narrow things down to a specific uh, data subject. But in other contexts, uh, it might not. For example, if you know that somebody is a barista at Starbucks, it still doesn't narrow things down very much. Um, then um, you also should take into account that when data are fully anonymous, which does mean that they can in no way be directed either uh, directly or indirectly to um, a person, so an identifiable person, 
that the GDPR does not apply as the data in that um, context will not be considered as personal data. Uh, linked with the anonymization is the pseudonymization of personal data. Um, pseudonymization is a processing of personal data so that the personal data can actually no longer be attributed to a data subjects without the use of additional information. And that additional information is then kept separately and subject to some measures, technical or organizational, um, which then allow you to find the key to indicate the original um, identity of the person involved. Um, currently, pseudonymized data are in principle not uh, considered as anonymous data, so the GDPR still applies to those data. However, we see that opinions on that are, are um, varying and that there are some dissenting opinions. For example, stating that um, depending on how difficult it is to attribute the pseudonym to the particular individual, pseudonymized data may in some, be, in some cases be anonymous. And um, those data can, for some third parties, be anonymous data as they do not have the key um, to encrypt the, the pseudonymization and link um, the data back to the identity of the person. However, there is no official statement yet in this regard, so it, means it remains to be seen um, what, what will be said about pseudonymized data and the um, GDPR applying to it or not. Then two other definitions that are used quite often in GDPR are the processor and the controller. Um, the processor is the legal entity or the person which processes the personal data, but processing has a very broad scope, so it means actually any action that you undertake with regard to the personal data, such as collecting it, storing it, um, adaptation, consultation, use, etc. Um, the controller is the entity or person that um, that determines the purpose of the, personing, uh, of the processing of the personal data and under GDPR the controller is held responsible to see that the processing is done in line uh, with GDPR. So when we come to the GDPR points of attention, um, I already touched upon it briefly, but there, the controller has an obligation to report data breaches and data breaches can be very broad. It can go from um, cyber crime, so somebody hacking your computer and deliberately stealing data, but it can also be that you have um, data of somebody on, on a, USB, a USB stick and you lose the USB stick. So in principle, data breaches uh, need to be um, reported uh, to the competent supervising authority. So in Belgium, that would be the Privacy Commission. Um, unless the personal data breach is unlikely to result in the rights um, um, to harm the rights of the natural persons. And you, in some cases, you also have to report a leak to the data subject uh, concerned. Um, if there is a high risk that the rights of the natural persons are, are um, in, infringed. And it's the, the data protection officer who makes an assessment whether is there, there is a high risk or not. So in case you believe you have lost data or you are confronted with a data breach, we would suggest that you contact your data protection officer or legal department to see what has to be done. Another point of attention is that you have to watch out when dealing with uh, synonymized data, as it might very well be that GDPR applies and that you have to verify the legal grounds uh, of the processing uh, of the personal data to, so to see whether the processing is um, allowed or not. But in general, we would, consult, uh, we would consult you to check with your DPO or legal department in case of doubt. So um, what impact does GDPR has for EPET in a nutshell? You, uh, as already indicated by Wouter, you have different data flow, flows within EPETs on a parent cohort level, on an LCS level and a POC level, and you have um, interaction between those levels. 
So it is important to verify on which basis the personal data is being processed and whether further processing is allowed or not. Um, and within EPET, we see that the legal justification for processing personal data is often based on the consent of the concerning data subject. Um, and under GDPR, the conditions for consent have, have become more stringent. So you have to take into account when you are dealing with personal data or processing of personal data that are based on consent, that there are a lot of uh, information that has to be shared or had to be shared with, uh, with the data subject involved. And in order for a consent to be valid, there are stringent conditions. Um, the consent has to be freely given. It has to be specific for that typical, that specific purpose. So um, the implied consent has been ruled out by GDPR. It is not because a um, um, data subject has not opposed to processing his data that it is allowed. He has to consent um, actively. It has to be explicit, informed, and uh, unambiguous. And the data subject also have the right to withdraw their consent. So given the numerous data flows uh, within EPETS, uh, to summarize, we would first advise to verify whether you are dealing with personal data or not, or on which basis uh, the processing is allowed, and to be cautious if um, the basis is informed consent, and in case of doubt, to contact your DPO of legal department. So first, um, you forgot a file with patient's information in your car and your car gets stolen. What do you do? You do nothing as the information on the file is not likely to harm the rights of the concerned data subject. You contact the competent supervising authority within 20, um, 72 hours or you, con you contact your DPO or legal department as soon as possible. So any thoughts on this one? See, indeed, C is the correct answer, as it might be that um, there, there is no risk or there for, for an infringement of the rights of the natural persons. So it has to be assessed whether um, the data breach has to be uh, reported or not. Second question, which entities need to comply with GDPR rules? A, entities that process personal data of European data subjects and that offer goods or services within the EU. Only European entities that process European personal data or all entities within and outside the Europe, uh, within or outside Europe. C. It's actually A. a. Um, so if you have an entity that's not based in the European Union, then that entity will still have to um, comply with GDPR if it processes data of European data subjects. And C, all entities is not correct if, if you are an entity outside the EU not processing any um, data from the EU subjects, then GDPR does not apply. Uh, next question. The GDPR has provided that entities can no longer rely on implied consent as a legal basis for processing of personal data. True or false? Any guesses? So implied consent uh, means that when a data subject does not explicitly um, refuses the right of his um, data being processed, that it is allowed. So that's, yeah, that's true. So it is true the GDPR has prevented implied only explicit and actively consent is allowed um, if your processing is based on an individual's consent. So the last question, the informed consent uh, sheet, which you use to process uh, the concerning data subject personal data, give consent to do so with regard to project E, but not with regard to related project B. You need those data for project B, what do you do? 
you ask uh, the concerned data subject for a new informed consent with regard to project B, you check with your DPO or legal department whether further processing is possible, or you can use the data also for project B as the purpose of the data processing of project B is related to the purpose of project E. Maybe A. Actually, it's B, because in some cases it might be that the informed consent sheet may be used for further processing um, as research purposes in some cases is considered to be um, compatible with the initial uh, purpose. But we would advise you to check with your DPO as it is not always clear cut whether you can base yourself on the initial informed consent or not. So we are at the end of our presentation. We would like to thank you for, for your attention and attending the webinar. Um, if you would still have questions after this webinar, do not hesitate to contact us. And yeah, that it, that's it. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>